There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. When I was a teenager, growing up on the outskirts of a small town on the Oregon coast, I was full of angst and frustration and a wish that I could be somewhere else, anywhere else. The world is full of something else and somewhere else and I wasn't there. If only I could escape. Well, there was seaside. One of the escapes into the exotic, the somewhere, the something else, without parents, circa 1964, was to drive to Seaside, Oregon, perhaps through uh, rain, almost always through rain on the Oregon coast, uh, with my friend Trudy to Cannes Hangkow Inn and indulge in chop suey, chow mein, pork fried rice, sweet and sour spare ribs, <clears throat> green tea, fortune cookies, egg foo young. Of course, we couldn't afford all of those, but one or two uh, we could afford. The Hangkow Inn was someplace else. And the people who ran it were people from someplace else, or so they seemed. They were a family, a Chinese-American family. They were here, but they were not of here, not of seaside somehow. The food was here, but not of here. And the Chinese restaurant was one of our few glimpses into the wide world that we knew lurked out there somewhere beyond high school. And when I was a teenager, I thought that just as every town had a post office and a grocery store and a sawmill, it had a Chinese restaurant. That sense persisted through college and beyond as I eat in Chinese restaurants not only in Seaside and Roseburg and Pendleton, but also beyond Oregon, in New Mexico and the town of Las Vegas, in Providence, Rhode Island, in Juneau and San Francisco and Butte, Montana. So there's uh, a lot of chop suey in my past. <laughs> Chinese sojourners and immigrants were a notable component of Oregon's population from the 1850s into the 1920s. They were visible and they faced discrimination in working and living here. Initially, there were very few, very few Chinese women and very few Chinese families or children. <clears throat> Many families remained in China as Husbands came to the U.S. Uh, and many, many single men came to the U.S., um, a number of whom might go back to China and marry and have a family there and then come back here again to work. <clears throat> Cooking became one of the avenues to acceptance for Chinese, particularly Chinese men. Um, first for single men who worked as cooks in homes and cafes and hotels and then as proprietors of restaurants that catered to both American tastes, think hamburgers and french fries, <clears throat> and to Chinese tastes. In time, the Chinese American cafe, Cantonese cuisine, uh, often a family-run institution, as families became gradually more uh, uh, familiar and possible in Oregon, became an institution, both in Portland and in many, many small towns throughout the state. Yep. Are we not going to move? There we are. Okay. <laughs> Chinese mining. Yes. As it happens, Oregon's story of Chinese sojourners and immigrants is quite different from their story in New Mexico or Rhode Island or even California. Before we get to the food part of the story, we need to take a quick look at the nation's Chinese sojourners and immigrants. It starts with gold. Gold in California. The discovery there of gold in 1848 quickly brought fortune seekers from the east, the west, the north, the south, from Chile, from Germany, from wherever. <clears throat> Among the first to hear of the discoveries were farmer settlers in southern Oregon and Willamette Valley of Oregon. Um, many of them ran off quickly to find gold. Many of them came back and decided they could make better money by growing wheat and shipping it to miners in California and getting the gold that way. And traders around the port city of Canton. Canton is, is known today as Guangzhou. It's in the province of uh, Guangdong, which used to be called Canton. And that's the area around Hong Kong, Macau, um, and, uh, and, and Guangzhou. 
For Oregon farmers, California was a fairly quick journey by land or by sea. For the Cantonese, it was a reasonable sea voyage away along established trade routes. Canton Province in the 1850s sent many thousands of its residents to California. Most of them were young, unmarried, and poor. Canton Province was poor and economically depressed uh, in the 1840s. And um, many of these, in fact, perhaps most, came essentially as indentured servants. They owed their passage money uh, to uh, labor contractors who uh, paid their passage and they had to pay that back. Most hoped to find gold and hum come home, go home to China. Those are the people we call sojourners. They were temporary residents. <clears throat> Oops, did we, yeah. But many stayed. Those who stayed faced many obstacles to a decent livelihood. There was widespread discrimination based on the many differences in skin color, religion, customs, language, while Chinese on the West Coast found employment in railroad construction in the 1860s and 70s, many followed other gold rushes into Oregon, Washington, Idaho, British Columbia, and Montana. Uh, here you see an illustration from a San Francisco uh, magazine, uh, The Wasp, which uh, describes the Chinese, as you see at the bottom there, uh, many-handed but soulless. So they seem to have their hands involved in many things, but they're not all uh, to the uh, benefit of those uh, white residents of California. I didn't do that. Um, so you see uh, uh, Chinese somehow contributing to uh, everything from uh, drug addiction and uh, poverty and uh, depriving widows of uh, living and so on. It's uh, <clears throat> not, not a pleasant picture. Accusations that the Chinese could and would work for less pay than white men became a major labor issue on the West Coast in the 1880s. <clears throat> when murder, riots, and forced expulsion of the Chinese rocked San Francisco and Tacoma and many smaller cities. California and Oregon witnessed a variety of state and local taxes and restrictive measures on land owning and voting. Uh, Josephine County was noted for an especially onerous uh, tax on Chinese gold miners. But the big thing was, uh, the restrictive measure was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a congressional uh, action, which was in fact this nation's first significant restriction on immigration to the United States, and it was based entirely on race and class. <clears throat> While Chinese merchants, as well as diplomats and teachers and students, could travel and bring family members to the United States and could legally reside here, laborers led a much more restricted life. They could not bring their families. Full citizenship became an impossibility. Before that, it was a possibility. And some did become citizens. Here you see... Uh, a British uh, satire magazine, Puck, illustrating the problem. This is in the 1880s. The cap says Oregon. And the guy with the uh, guns in both hands says Hobson's choice. You can go or you can stay. If you go, well, jump off the cliff. If you stay, it will kill you. Um, that kind of attitude was not universal, but it was prevalent. Keep in mind that uh, California and San Francisco, Gold Mountain, was a nexus of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The 1850 U.S. Census found fewer than a thousand Chinese in the United States, nearly all of them in California. Now the census in this period maybe, probably does, uh, undercount, but at least gives us uh, a, a, a basis. By the 1860 census, there were 35,000 Chinese, virtually all of them on the West Coast. <clears throat> By 1880, the figure is 105,000 in the U.S., 75,000 of those in California, and 9,500 in Oregon. Although California's Chinese population was but a fraction of California's, 
This state still held more Chinese than any other U.S. state except California. Portland hosted the nation's second largest Chinatown. Did we lose things? <laughs> Looks like we did. Um, Portland hosted uh, uh, the nation's second largest Chinatown and about 10% uh, of the city's population by the end of the century was Chinese. Other Chinese were scattered throughout the state, particularly along the lines of the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific Railroads, <clears throat> and in fish canneries in Astoria, and in mining areas such as Baker, Jackson, and Grant counties. Now we hope to find another picture. <laughs> well, when it comes back, we'll show you a picture of, uh, um, of uh, Portland's uh, Chinatown in 1886. Um, as it appeared in West Shore magazine. West Shore was a Portland Illustrated um, weekly or monthly at various times. And uh, in 1886, which was uh, as the Chinese uh, must go, the fever called uh, Chinese, the Chinese must go, uh, was fading a bit. And they did a, uh, an entire article on the Chinese in Portland and Oregon. <coughs> it's called West Shore. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll see that when the, when the uh, time arrives. The exclusion law dampened the number of Chinese in the U.S., as you might expect, and the population declines after 1900. In that year, there were 47,000, well, 45,000 plus uh, Chinese in California and more than 10,000 in Oregon. That's the height of the Chinese population um, in that period. By 1920, Oregon's Chinese population falls to a bit over 3,000. And by um, 1930, 1940, 1950, it hovers around 2,000. Now, that's a very small number, but it's still a visible and significant presence in the state. In a way, we'll see how chop suey, Chinese restaurants, played a big role in establishing, establishing and maintaining that visibility as you can tell by the fact that I thought every town had a Chinese restaurant. Dum -de -dum -de -dum -de -dum. <laughs> well, I don't need any illustrations for a little while, so I'll continue. Um, in this presentation, we'll look at several phases of Chinese cooks and cooking in Oregon. Um, first, we're going to look at Chinese cooking for other Chinese. Then at uh, Chinese cooking American foods. And this typically would mean in homes or hotels or cafes, that type of thing. Um, then we'll look at the chop suey craze of the early 20th century and the mid 20th century. Then we'll look at the new wave of Chinese restaurants from the 1970s. And finally, at the legacy of Chinese and Chinese food in, uh, in Oregon. <clears throat> Chinese cooking for other Chinese. As sojourners in a strange land, the Chinese had to make many adaptations. Most of the men who came over were not cooks. Women were usually the cooks in Chinese families, but these men had to eat, and of necessity they developed some skills at cooking. Chinese railroad workers were segregated by race, and some of them had to cook. They were with a gang of Chinese railroad workers. Somebody in that gang better cook. <clears throat> From the 1850s into the 1890s, when the Chinese population in Oregon hit its peak, Chinese cooks were chiefly cooking for other Chinese. And they were having to make do with what they had here, which included different vegetables, uh, different kinds of uh, meats, um, and um, the fact that some ingredients, such as rice and soy sauce, were imported. They were not available locally, nor were there any other uh, easy substitutes for them. Uh, if we pop back to the uh, West Shore illustration from 1886 of Portland, and here you see some of the kinds of uh, trades that are um, plied by Chinese in Portland. 
um, dealing with laundries and uh, janitorial work and fixing shoes and barbering and other, sawing wood and so on. And in the center there you have a, uh, an image of a uh, um, typical uh, Italianate storefront in Portland's Chinatown. Uh, it's not owned by the Chinese but it is leased or rented and uh, they have added some touches that are characteristic of Chinatowns uh, from the 19th century um, worldwide, um, including the, uh, the round windows and the balconies, which become uh, noticeable elements. Notice that all of the occupations pictured are ex existential, essentially occupations that can be done by individuals or small groups of people um, they don't require big investments, and they are all servile. They're all things that the Chinese do for the white man. And uh, those are the kinds of things that are most open to them. The other openings are things like cannery work, uh, where one, uh, you know, there's, there's a big operation and you are simply one cog of it, uh, but it, the uh, operations of the cannery are segregated by race. Chinese do certain tasks in that, and. Um, Caucasians and others do others. Um, here we see a, a photograph uh, of a group of Chinese uh, um, track maintenance workers. Um, this is on the Corvallis and Eastern Railroad, which, uh, and this is probably on their line going east from, from Albany into the Cascade Mountains. And uh, again, this is the kind of group for which there may be one of the men who is better at cooking and uh, takes on that responsibility. This is a photograph of 2nd Avenue in downtown Portland, about 1890. Um, you see on the right uh, is that uh, building that was pictured in the 1886 West Shore illustration. And if you look in the uh, lower right corner, blow it up a little bit here, you see <coughs> Hang Fung La Restaurant. Now that gives you a couple of uh, clues right there um, that uh, this is a restaurant that uh, is in Chinatown and probably serves a Chinese um, clientele, but the, uh, the name there is in English. There probably are also um, Caucasians who uh, also eat there. <clears throat> Let me give you a brief uh, description of the, uh, uh, a, a Chinese restaurant. This is from that West Shore uh, magazine article in which it describes going into a Chinese restaurant. <clears throat> From there, we invaded a restaurant and were piloted through the establishment. From the kitchen to the apartments where customers who desire can take an after-dinner siesta and smoke a pipe of tobacco or opium. The chairs and tables were of solid ebony and of peculiar pattern, and the interior decorations were thoroughly oriental in every particular, as is clearly shown in the artist's sketch. The genial host invited us to partake of a cup of tea which was the smallest in quantity and the most delicious in taste that ever passed the writer's lips. Your true Chinaman takes his tea clear and laughs with lofty scorn at the American habit of killing the flavor with sugar and cream. In addition to Chinese operating uh, restaurants and, and being involved in food, um, there were other ways that that uh, occurred as well. This shows uh, Chin Rim, who was a Portland uh, grocery who delivered his groceries, um, as you see here, on, on a wagon. Often they were also done uh, by carrying baskets of vegetables and so on. One of Portland's two or three, depending on how you count it, Chinatowns was located in an area called Goose Hollow, and that was a semi-rural uh, enclave of uh, Chinese who did market gardening. And people like Chin uh, Rim would then uh, take these vegetables around and sell them in the streets and to, of course, uh, Chinese merchants. Now one thing to mention is that at this period, opium is not yet an illegal substance. It's frowned upon by many. Um, but it also brings up the fact that Chinese establishments, such as restaurants, were often, um, um, in, in the minds of many Americans, associated with various sinful activities, drugs, prostitution, gambling, uh, and so on. And 
Uh, so there is this sort of uh, shady side of things that is part of both the, uh, uh, the push away factor, but also part of the uh, intriguing, exotic, uh, hmm, I want to know more about it uh, aspect of uh, a, <coughs> a group of Chinese in, in town. So um, here you see a, a photograph of opium smoking, which uh, did occur. And then here we have one of those respectable uh, Chinese merchants. This is uh, Siad Back, who was uh, a uh, merchant and uh, labor contractor in Portland. Uh, I'll give you a little bit from uh, 1902. There was a newspaper article uh, called How the Siads Feasted. Chinese family gives banquet to all its many cousins. And here you see some of the uh, family relationships that are growing up. There was a sound of revelry last night in the Chinese restaurant at the corner of Second and Pine. The occasion was a reunion of the members of the Seed family. The family is represented in Portland by about 90 men and boys, to say nothing of the women and girls who did not attend the reunion. Eight tables were spread in the spacious banquet hall of the restaurants laid with 12 to 14 covers each, and so on about, about this. The pioneer member of the family here is Seed Back, who has been a resident of Portland for 34 years, and comes as near being Americanized as it is possible for a native of China to be. The other members of the Seed family have been in this country from 20 to 30 years, and all are workers and self-supporting, not a loafer among them, as Seed Back proudly, proudly stated. Nearly all of them are cannery boys who will soon be going off to work in canneries all the way from the Columbia to Alaska. And the reunion was to give them a chance to be all together before scattering. So there's a description then of what was eaten th at the banquet. Um, and it says, uh, as Chinese names, in Chinese names, the family name comes first as Smith John. So in their banquet, the dessert is partaken of first and sakes, fruits, pastry, nuts were served first. Then came green turtle, shark's fins, preserved eel, bird's nest pudding, and of course, plenty of pork, of which Chinese are very fond. And in addition, many delicacies of which outsiders know nothing. <clears throat> so that is how the merchant class was eating, at least at a banquet. So let's look a bit about Chinese cooking, not for other Chinese, but cooking for immigrants from Japan and, or pardon me, from, <laughs> from Germany and Italy and Scandinavia and uh, New York State and other places. We'll call that American. <laughs> Cheers. Chinese cooks in America had to deal with the foods at hand, which were often unfamiliar to them. What Caucasian cooks did with the food at hand was also unfamiliar preparations. And many Chinese came to, ad to adapt not only to American foods, but also to American food preparation. As a result, many Chinese were able to make a living cooking in family kitchens and in white owned and run cafes and hotels. But keep in mind the prejudice often blocked the road to success. Um, Oregon newspapers and advertising in the 19th century provide many examples of this. And here are just, just a scattered few from the 1870s and 1880s in which it is emphasized that Chinese cooks are not to be found in this establishment. Now, besides the kind of connotation of uh, perhaps something sinful going on in a place that had Chinese, there was also sometimes the uh, suspicion that they were cooking things like rats or cats or something else that really shouldn't be eaten by decent people. And that was part of what was behind this no Chinese cooks. Another thing to keep in mind is that Another phrase that you see is white help only employed in ads for, for restaurants and, and cafes and so on. 
That is not directed at African Americans. There were far fewer of those in Oregon. Those, those kinds of statements were directed almost entirely at Chinese. White cook employed, or white help only employed means no Chinese. <clears throat> Here's another example of a different kind of uh, prejudice. Um, this is uh, published in the Corvallis Gazette, uh, which borrowed it from the Portland Oregonian, which probably borrowed it from another newspaper from we don't know where. Um, and the story says, uh, turned end for end. Many fancy stories have been told, first and last, about Chinese cooks. And people who have had dealings with this class are generally firm believers in the old saying that the Lord sends victuals, but the devil sends cooks. <laughs> a case in point occurred in this city, we don't know which one, a day or two since. A lady engaged a cook who had been represented to her as an artist <clears throat> in his line. Her husband, who was tired of ill-cooked food, on hearing of the new acquisition, determined to have something a little extra in the grub line. <clears throat> so he carried home that evening a lot of brains and some oxtails. He delivered them to John, John being a common generic term for a Chinese man, telling him to fry the brains for breakfast and make some soup for dinner of the oxtails. Next morning he came down to breakfast, his mouth <clears throat> watering in anticipation. But what was his disgust when on removing the cover from the dish set before him, he saw the oxtails fried brown. The Chinese cooks must go is now that man's motto. It is, however, not so very singular <clears throat> that one of a nation who have no alphabet for their language, who wear their shirts outside their pantaloons, and whose compass points to the south, should expect to find the brains at the wrong end of an ox. <laughs> so said the Oregonian in 1883, in the height of the anti-Chinese uh, <coughs> fever. So we also find that the Chinese are certainly not very bright, and, uh, and so on. So throughout the 1880s and 90s, jibes and slurs like this are very common in newspapers and periodicals and so on. It's not an easy life. Some years ago, I began collecting Oregon restaurant menus. And one of my earliest acquisitions was a menu from the State Cafe of Huntington, Oregon. Any of you ever been to Huntington? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's way over there uh, on the Snake River um, uh, between Baker and Ontario. Uh, it's uh, still there. It's off of I-5. It was a railroad uh, division point and repair facility. In uh, the early uh, 20th century, it had a population of about 1,500. It's less than a third of that now. So here's this menu I picked up. This is Main Street in Huntington, uh, probably about 1915 or 20. There were several clues inside the menu that told me that it was from World War I era. And the State Cafe was probably what I would call a hash house a kind of place that would serve workers, uh, fuel food, it was probably open 24 hours a day or close to it, and uh, had no, put on no fancy airs. It, it was a, a fuel, fuel stop. <clears throat> the variety of offerings is amazing. This is the menu, and you see the categories, game and poultry and season, Steaks and chops, those are just the sauces. Fish, cold dishes, sandwiches, salads, relishes, cakes and pies, potatoes and vegetables. Look at all the vegetables, drinks served. Puget Sound oysters, clams, and uh, etc. There are 18 different preparations for oysters on this menu. Oysters are not an exotic food at this time in this place. They are protein and they are cheap. The expensive stuff is chicken. Chicken, chicken is pricey stuff. <clears throat> well, I asked the uh, Huntington Historical Society if they had any information about the State Cafe. 
And uh, to my surprise, I learned that the proprietor was a Chinese man named Sam Key. And this uh, kind of gave me a, a new platform to stand on to research this. And when I looked at the menu again, I thought, I saw down there at the bottom of steaks and chops, noodles, noodles and coffee, noodles and catsup, chicken noodles. That's the only clue that says maybe a Chinese man is involved in this operation. And you may not think that noodles and coffee are so great, but uh, maybe if you're an engineman about to go out on duty uh, and you want some wake up stuff and some, uh, something warm and uh, full of carbs, uh, that's the thing. So uh, this menu is not designed to serve a Chinese population, but a bunch of white workers um, who want to fuel up. But there is a touch of chi something Chinesey to be there. Research showed me that Sam Key uh, was, was somebody. Um, he's described, the first uh, reference I found to him in online newspapers uh, was in 1907 when he was described as the well-known restaurant keeper in Wallula, Washington, a railroad town. In 1910, he shows up operating a restaurant in the railroad town of Umatilla, Oregon. He burns down in 1911, but he quickly rebuilds it. In 1912, he shows up running a chop suey and noodle house in the railroad town of Klamath Falls. In the 1920s, he got in trouble for opium and gambling in Portland. He was probably visiting. And in 1924, when he was still operating the State Cafe in Huntington, he got arrested for selling opium, which now was illegal. The range and breadth of Sam Key's menu is an indication of his ability to give his mostly Caucasian public what they wanted. The noodles are incidental. And the State Cafe, with its American name and its white working class clientele, is not catering to uh, people like teenage me looking for something exotic and uh, uh, different. <laughs> So being a personal cook is another way that Chinese men found um, an occupation. And you see here a well-to-do family somewhere in Oregon. Uh, mom and dad and daughter and the Chinese cook. This is the personal servant of F.E. Judd of Pendleton, Oregon. Um, he was the treasurer of the Port uh, Pendleton Woolen Mills in this period, about 1915, and was also the officer of the Pendleton Bank. And we also know that uh, his uh, servant uh, did his cooking. And here is a, a curious uh, picture. Uh, this is um, Edmund N. Edes and his servant Kiwi, shown about 1900. Um, I couldn't find out very much about Mr. Edes. He looks like he's so distinguished that certainly somebody would have written something about him in the paper, but uh, not much. But we do know that he owned what was described as a candy kitchen, <laughs> candy kitchen and oyster parlor in Salem. Now you thought noodles and coffee was an odd combination. What do you think of oysters and candy? And you may know of James Beard, Oregon's uh, n noted uh, culinary uh, writer and, and uh, who wrote a wonderful autobiography called Delights and Prejudices, in which he makes frequent mention of uh, the Chinese cooks in his uh, mother's household, in particular one called Let. Um, he also uh, brings Let up a number of times in his uh, major American cookery cookbook. Um, James Beard grew up in Oregon, in Portland, and uh, his mother, Elizabeth, operated a boarding house and um, hotel, and she was frustrated by the parade of what she described as uh, short-staying, fancy, Frenchified cooks, <laughs> um, because they, uh, they got airs. They thought they were really hot stuff, and so they cooked for her for a while and then went off to San Francisco and be, you know, better appreciated. So, she, uh, Beard describes her as hiring several Chinese, training them to cook the way she wanted things to be cooked, and, um, and then kept them. Uh, <laughs> she hung on to those folks. One of them becomes a, 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 an excellent pastry cook. Let becomes kind of the backbone of, of things. And um, 
he figures very strongly in there, uh, not only for mastering the techniques that Elizabeth wanted him to use and the foods that she wanted, but also that she learned things from him about cooking. <clears throat> I think one of the more amazing things about Beard in this is that I find it was like, well, when did this, his autobiography is kind of vague about dates and things. But he does say that when he was about 10 years old, Let returned to China. Uh, so some of these sojourners do go back. Um, but if Beard was only 10 years old, he had an amazing memory for the foods that he ate, that he could describe them, and the ways that Lett and his mother prepared them uh, when he was only 10 years old. Chinese men also found work as cooks in a variety of situations that involved cooking for a group of men, usually um, something like ranch cook, uh, railroad survey team cook, logging camps hired Chinese cooks out in the woods. Mining camps, same thing. Large lumber mills sometimes had um, a crew of uh, Chinese cooks. Um, and aboard coastal lumber schooners and uh, river steamboats. Uh, I was surprised to find a number of Chinese cooks who show up as a cook aboard a river steamer that runs between Portland and Astoria, or on a lumber schooner that hits Coos Bay and Brookings and so on in San Francisco. Here we have a picture of a uh, ranch cook, Quat uh, Hoi. Uh, the uh, Henry Wilkins Ranch was near the town of Clem. Any of you ever been to Clem? Do you know where Clem is? Well, Clem isn't anymore. <laughs> Clem's gone. Uh, it was near Ione, and there's not much of Ione left either. But uh, south of Arlington on the Columbia River, it's up on the Columbia Plateau um, in, in what's now wheat country. Here's a, a, a piece from uh, Cottage Grove newspaper in 1901. Uh, the newspaper is called the Bohemia Nugget, which can remind you that uh, Cottage Grove was once uh, at the edge of a gold mining country called the Bohemia Mines up in the Cascades. This 1901 article says, Sam, the Chinese cook at the Helena Mine, arrived in town Tuesday evening, having been at the mine for one year and 15 days without a vacation. He went to Portland Thursday for a month's visit. And we say good for him. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a crew, probably a railroad survey crew, somewhere in Oregon. Uh, second from the right, you see the Chinese cook with his apron and his uh, stylish hat. And another survey crew, this on the um, uh, a group for the uh, Pacific Railway and Navigation Company, which in the early 1900s built the railroad from Hillsboro over the coast range to Tillamook. And uh, their Chinese cook and their, their cat. We don't know this fellow's name, or I don't yet, uh, but he was a cook at the Oregon State Blind School in Salem about 1890. And you can see he is still in the dress of uh, his home country with distinctive shoes. He has a cue down the left, uh, down his left side there, and a distinctive cap. Uh, about 1915, this is the Chinese cook at the uh, major downtown hotel in Albany, the Albany Hotel. And here's a uh, interesting item. This is actually a, a blow up of a business card from the Lumberman's Cafe, Vern Singleton, proprietor. Vern was in, uh, came to, to Bend in the uh, 19, early 20s when Bend was booming from the two huge new lumber mills there, Brooks Scanlon and um, Shevlin Hickson Company. And Mr. Singleton ran a cafe. It says, we never close, try our Chinese dishes. So he probably had a Chinese cook. Um, I cannot resist reading you the uh, other side of the, um, the card, which says, I have been balled out, balled up, held up and held down, bulldozed, blackjacked, walked on, cheated, squeezed and mooched, stuck for war tax, excess profits tax, per capita tax, state tax, dog tax and sin tax, liberty bonds, baby bonds and bonds of matrimony, red cross, green cross and double cross, Asked to help the Society of John the Baptist, the GAR, Women's Relief Corps, Men's Relief, and Stomach Relief. 
I have worked like hell. I have been drunk and have gotten others drunk, lost all I had and part of my furniture. And because I won't spend or lend all of the little I earn and go beg, borrow, or steal, I have been cussed and discussed, boycotted and talked to and talked about, lied to and lied about, held up and hung up, robbed and damn near ruined. And the only reason I am alive is because I eat at the Lumberman's Cafe. Wow. Yeah. Yay. And it may be the Chinese food that did it. <laughs> so the State Cafe is uh, an example uh, also of these kinds of situations like the, the uh, Blind School and the Albany Hotel and the Lumberman's Cafe of a, a Chinese um, um, working for a, a, a Caucasian establishment to feed them what they want. Here's uh, something a little different. This is a picture of Jim Louie in 1935. The year before that, the Oregon uh, journalist and uh, uh, folklorist and would-be historian um, Stuart Holbrook did an article in the Morning Oregonian. Um, he was writing about uh, things faintly um, uh, undergroundish like saloons and uh, uh, ladies of the night and so on, but goes off in another thing here. No mention of the profession, that is, of saloon keeper, in Portland would be complete without the name of the late Frank Huber. Mr. Huber ran the bureau, a high-class place, very quiet and orderly, and his customers were mostly from the business, professional, professional and general commercial circles of the town. He later moved his place into the new Railway Exchange Building, where the original bar and fixtures are part of Huber's restaurant, operated by Louis Jim uh, for many years. Known to thousands of Portlanders and visitors, Louis Jim came to this city from Canton, China, when he was a boy of 11, and went to work in the Peerless Cafe on Alder Street in 1891 uh, uh, to work uh, yeah, in 1891, he went to work for Mr. Huber at the Bureau, and he remained in, in his employee until Mr. Huber's death in 1916. Since then, Louis Jim has continued the place as a successful restaurant. He cut off his queue in 1912. 400 million Chinamen couldn't be wrong, he said. And that was a period of time when uh, those queues were cut by, by many Chinese. Well, Louis Jim bought the Huber's Cafe. Huber's Cafe is still in business and is still in the same building, no longer known as the Railway Exchange Building, but is this lovely 1910 Edwardian interior with mahogany booths and stained glass uh, atrium um, uh, glass over the tiled uh, floor uh, and a beautiful back bar with and palm trees and the whole works. It's in Portland. Uh huh. Downtown between, I think, 3rd and 4th on uh, Stark Streets. Um, it is still in the ownership of the Louis family. Um, and uh, in fact, it, uh, the other thing to note is that behind Mr. Louis is a turkey. Well, Mr. Huber had made a specialty of serving as free bar food in his bureau cafe, roast turkey. Jim Louie continued that. And turkey and coleslaw has been the mainstay of the dinner items at the Huber's, at Huber's Cafe ever since. Wow. Still is, although you can now get fish and beefsteak and many other things as well. Um, and it's also become something of a uh, rendezvous for um, trendy young techies and others. Um, back in the 70s, um, Jim's grandson, who was then trying to beef up the operation, um, started making uh, Spanish coffee drinks, which is Kahlua and coffee flaming. And he made quite a performance out of it, of pouring it from above and the flames fall into the cup and this hot coffee drink. Doesn't seem to go with either Chinese or with Turkey, but <laughs> on its own, as a bar item, it was hot stuff, and it still is. For a number of years, Huber sold more Kahlua than any other bar in the U.S. <laughs> I don't know if it's still number one, but it's still up there. How does it for Chinese food? None. They don't serve, they don't serve Chinese food. No. 
It's quite, well, you can get uh, beef and other things, but it's, it's definitely an American menu, and it's an updated American menu. But uh, the staff is uh, in part Chinese and family. So let's uh, jump into the uh, chop suey craze, because chop suey is what the title is about, after all. <clears throat> Wish I could get rid of that stupid. <laughs> anyway, this is a menu from um, a well-known, once well-known Portland restaurant, uh, Hung Far Low. Um, depending on your your age, you may or not may or may not snicker at that name. Uh, there was also a a, a better known uh, Chinese restaurant in San Francisco called Hang Farlow. Um, and the meaning is nothing to be snickered at, but is about apricot blossoms and tower or building and pink. So, pink, pink the pink. color, yes. So erase all those other thoughts from your mind. But Hung Far Low uh, was a Portland institution from 1928 when it opened in New Chinatown. Um, into the 1990s uh, when it moved to 82nd Avenue in Portland and then quietly died last year. Chop suey appears early in the 20th century. Here you see uh, quite a lot of chop suey varieties. Um, this was from an eight-page menu um, and it's, it's almost all Asian dishes or so-called, uh, a little bit of American stuff at the end. Um, it uses, of course, chop suey uses ingredients that are easily available in the U.S. To those who come to uh, order it and crave it, however, are mostly Caucasians, not Chinese, uh, those attracted to the exotic and, uh, and to the lure of, you know, gambling opium, etc. Here's another uh, one of these borrowed articles. This one from, again, the Cottage Grove Bohemian Nugget which picked it up from some other newspaper. And the, the main thrust of the article was about someone's attempt, and I, I saw this, this story in a number of other newspapers. Some get, fellow tried to copyright the recipe for chop suey and the name chop suey. He did not succeed at this, but it created quite a hullabaloo in the press. And it led to, to other things here. Uh, there's a San Francisco Chinaman in town who claims to have copyright on this. It must be explained, first of all, that chop suey is not a Chinese dish. This is no news even to amateur Orientalists, but probably it is to the average American citizen. It is a San Francisco invention, or rather adaptation. It is an Irish stew translated into Chinese for purely Occidental degustation. With its usual black ignorance of oriental ways, the American public accepted it at once as the Chinese national dish, <laughs> upon which the Son of Heaven and his imperial household are supposed to dine every day. Even American officials were surprised when Prince Pu Lun, who was visiting the U.S. about this time, um, in, inquired in Chinatown the other day, what is chop suey? <laughs> Oriental or Occidental, it is a good dish. It constitutes a ration in which a nice balance has been received, reached between the animal and the vegetable, between protein and mere bulk. <clears throat> oh, what's in it? Well, of course, I didn't bring that part here. Um, it can be a mixture of things, but we'll we'll tell you. Um, it's a, a protein, usually pork, sometimes chicken, um, some vegetables, commonly uh, celery, onions, bean sprouts, which may be in these early years canned because they weren't easily procurable elsewise, um, and uh, sometimes an assortment of, of uh, water chestnuts may be put in it and so on. Um, it's stir fried and then usually served uh, with a sauce, a clear sauce. Uh, over rice. And there are, of course, many variations, but um, those, those are kind of the essentials. And um, the fact that it is malleable is, of course, one of its chief virtues. 
So here we have a picture of the Clarno Hotel, probably about 1920. This is just a small, you know, cheap hotel on the east side of Portland. On the ground floor, though, there is a little shop. And it says in the window, noodles and chop suey. And uh, it looks like there's a curtain in that center window there. Those are noodles hanging up to dry. <laughs> I tried to blow it up and it just all kind of fell apart, but, um, and I couldn't get them to do me a better scan. <laughs> but uh, that's, things, things are you know, moving into, out of Chinatown into other areas. Here's an ad from 1905 in the Portland Oregonian, July 1st. An ad for the Lai Hung Chang Chinese restaurant. <clears throat> now open and ready for business. Our specialties, noodles a la Lai, Lai Hung Chang, chop suey a la Wu Ting Fang, rice, pork and chicken, cook and serve to the most fastidious. We serve, all, we serve tea with all orders at reasonable rates. Give us a call at 871 Thurman Street, main entrance to the fairgrounds. 1905, Lewis and Clark, World's Fair and Oriental Trade Exposition in Portland. Um, there is no Chinese food on, on the campus, so to speak, of the fair, but right outside you could get chop suey and chow mein. And chow mein, incidentally, is pretty much like chop suey. Um, the major difference being that being, rather than being served over rice, it's usually served over noodles, which may be uh, fried or may be not fried. In 1905, also later on, the Daily Journal ran a, an ad for the uh, uh, for a, a restaurant, and it says, and head, the headline is, "We cater to white folks." <laughs> our bill of fare consists of anything the palate may crave, but our chop suey and noodles are the delicious dishes that captivate the heart. Give us one trial, and you will never desert this restaurant. Yun Kin Lung Chinese Restaurant. Chop suey and noodles, teas, and cake. Things weren't always uh, hunky-dory at chop suey joints. Um, this is a story that uh, plays out in the two newspapers a little differently. The Oregon Journal was a little bit more um, friendly toward the Chinese than the Oregonian was. Uh, notice here that the Oregonian has a story called Draw, about drawing the color line, attitude of society leaders clearly defined at fashionable chop suey dinner party. The same story is written in the Oregon Journal as white man finds celestial released. Um, the basic story was that um, a couple of uh, gentlemen accompanied by some young ladies went to a Chinese restaurant and uh, one of the ladies reported to her, one of her hosts, that there was a Chinese gentleman over there who was, uh, what was he doing? He was winking at her and making motions with his hand. So uh, the host, Mr. Palmer, got up and threatened this gentleman. And uh, the Chinese gentleman stood up and was popped in the nose. So, you know, what happens is that, um, you know, Mr. Palmer gets arrested by the patrolman, but he brings charges against the Chinese man too. And uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, T. Lee is discharged and uh, Mr. Palmer is fined $40. Fairly substantial sum in those days. Good deal. Yeah, sometimes it worked out that way. Other times it didn't. The proliferation of Chinese restaurants catering to a white population occurs as the number of Chinese in Oregon is declining and then stabilizing. In 1900, there are more than 10,000 Chinese in the census. <clears throat> 10 years later, it's about 7,000. 1920, about 3,000. Next three censuses, it's about 2,000. <clears throat> Portland has a Chinatown. It's anchored primarily by a few restaurants and some curio stores. Beginning in the 19-teens, Oregon's small town Chinese restaurants, there were an increasing number of them, and they were increasingly family operated rather than being run by an itinerant single male like Sam Key. 
Gradually, the Chinese population, although it remained stable, the proportion of women and children did increase. As uh, exclusion law was eased up a bit in the 19 teens, uh, restaurant workers, for example, uh, were classified as laborers and they could not bring family members. But then in the teens, restaurant owners were admitted to the merchant class. And so they could bring wives and children. And so you see a gradual changing in the composition of the population. Gradually more wives and children are present and they help in restaurant work. Uh, that's one of the uh, characteristics of a family owned restaurant, uh, especially Chinese owned, is that the kids also uh, work. So everybody works. <clears throat> so small towns are fertile ground for new restaurants, even if they've not had a Chinese population in the past. It turned out also to be a, a way of becoming integrated into a community, running a restaurant where many, many different people came. Between 1900 and 1915, I kind of scanned uh, where I found Chinese restaurants in Oregon. It's a long list. Portland, St. John's, which was then a separate city, Hepner, Albany, Salem, Astoria, Pendleton, Cottage Grove, La Grande, Huntington, Baker City, Sumter, Hood River, Marshfield, now Coos Bay, Oregon City, Roseburg, Medford, Monmouth, Umatilla, Hermiston, Vale, Klamath Falls, Grants Pass. <clears throat> this is the uh, Club Cafe in Burns, Oregon. Um, the Yi family came to Burns in the early 1920s when Burns was, uh, uh, became home to a huge new lumber mill, just as uh, Bend had a few years earlier. And uh, so there was a, a huge working uh, population there. And they opened the uh, Club Cafe. The club has uh, remained. <laughs> uh, those uh, pictures on the wall there at the right are still to be found in Burns. Mm -hmm. In the same building? Same establishment, different building. Well, I'll show you a little more. <laughs> Um, this is uh, Klamath Falls, and you notice right in the center there, big neon sign, Chop Suey. This is 1920s. This is Salem, 1938. Chop Suey. Uh, right on Commercial Street, main part of town. So they're kind of all over the place. I mean, we have the Golden Pheasant in Portland. The Westlake Inn, sounding not at all like a Chinese restaurant uh, in Portland. The Tioga Coffee Shop, doesn't sound Chinese at all, but that's what it is, it's a Chinese cafe. Uh, the Tioga Hotel in Coos Bay, uh, the building still stands, it's named for a place in Pennsylvania. And coffee shop doesn't sound like, you know, noodles and chop suey either. And here a menu from the White Restaurant in the Dalles, Oregon, with a distinguished looking lawyerly type on the cover. And inside, it's Chinese on the left and American on the right. So things change. This is a photo from what was called Old Chinatown in Portland, um, taken in 1954, just before this building was demolished. Uh, this is an example of one of these. Um, the Chinese restaurant is upstairs. Here's noodles, chop suey, going in and you go upstairs to the, to the restaurant. And that's a kind of restaurant that served both Chinese and American clientele. But there's a new wave coming along. Uh, Leonard Lee gets his picture in the paper because he's a visiting demonstration cook <laughs> on Cantonese cuisine and uh, came to Portland in 1937. While some Portland restaurants served primarily a Chinese clientele, elsewhere they were dependent upon Caucasians who were seeking novelty and entertainment along with dinner. And Chinese restaurants began to appear in other parts of, of Portland. 
um, such as the Pagoda in the Hollywood District and the Canton Grill uh, on uh, 82nd Avenue. These are uh, two early menus from the Canton Grill, which opened in 1944. And uh, they didn't have any pictures of a China, Chinese person, to, for the printer didn't have them. So he puts a Frenchified chef on the cover. And uh, two years later, we have Canton Grill. Now we have some Asian-influenced artwork in the, in the uh, font. Uh, but we have a sophisticated couple dancing as entertainment. Liquor and dancing are added to the repertoire of um, the Chop Suey restaurant. Here's a picture of the uh, pagoda on the left. You see the uh, um, architecture that was uh, designed to give you a sense of the exotic orient. Uh, lit up with neon. This building was recently um, <clears throat> torn to pieces and turned into a key bank, but uh, much to the uh, disgust of the residents of the Hollywood neighborhood who thought this was something of an icon. And here, pardon? Portland. In Portland, yes. Uh -huh. And at the bottom you see a, a photo from the 50s. Uh, ladies in hats and uh, gentlemen in suits um, on a a night out in an exotic Chinese restaurant. Uh, the Chinese host is, is uh, dressed in, in a business suit. And here's a typical uh, couple in the 1950s at the Pagoda in Portland with an Asian, uh, Asian influenced mural in the background and uh, you know tea on the table. <clears throat> the repeal of the Chinese exclusion law, the final parts were uh, um, repealed in 1943 when China was, after all, one of our allies in World War II. Didn't do too well to be uh, exclusionary uh, at a time like this. It also led, of course, to a post-war uh, World War II influx of Asian war brides. And uh, that led, again, to a creation of new families of uh, Asian uh, uh, heritage. And uh, many of those began to look for enterprises that they could indulge in, um, including restaurants in small cities. This is a group of Chinese uh, war brides being feted at the Golden Dragon restaurant upstairs at 3rd and Oak Streets in Portland. Um, 1946, I think it is, um, by the Chinese uh, uh, Business Association. And that uh, bit of uh, post-war uh, business, this is 1946, 49, pardon me, uh, when Wong's Cafe in Klamath Falls opened. Wong's is still in business on uh, the main street of Klamath Falls. Looks like this. Uh, still in Chinese family ownership, although it's a different family from the originals, uh, which were the Wongs, uh, and subsequently by the Liangs. And places like Kim's in Medford. Kim's was actually uh, created by members of three different families. And um, uh, was a, as we all know, a, uh, uh, a landmark along I-5 and the Pacific Highway in Southern Oregon for decades. And here's a menu from another kind of typical Oriental Garden dine and dance Chinese American Cantonese style in McMinnville, the heart of uh, quiet Baptist uh, Yamhill County. Uh, but you could still go kick up your heels and dance and drink liquor and eat exotic Chinese food in the 1950s in McMinnville. By the 1950s, when I became aware of the existence of Chinese restaurants in Seaside and Astoria and Portland, the pattern of the early 1900s of lone Chinese men operating mostly on their own or as cooks in white-owned establishments, serving American food as well as noodles, was changing to one of family-owned and operated restaurants, but with that same dual menu, Chinese and American. 
And there's a bit of uh, moving out and about, too. This is Eddie Louie of the Louie family of Hubers. Um, he set off on his own and opened the new cafe restaurant uh, in the 1950s on 82nd Avenue in Portland. 82nd Avenue is now being promoted as the Jade District of Portland. It's a hideous street, but <laughs> visually. But it is lined with um, not only Chinese uh, restaurants from the chop suey era, but also with the restaurants and enterprises, markets, from many other Asian immigrant groups, Korean and Hmong and Vietnamese and so on. And uh, that has uh, given rise to uh, a, a whole new district. Uh, on the Oregon coast, the Golden Sampan grew up in Depot Bay. That building is still there. It's not a Chinese restaurant anymore. Um, but uh, it was, and it served, of course, the, the Cantonese Chinese family dinners with the usual uh, egg flour soup and uh, jumbo shrimp, deep fried shrimp, chow mein, uh, fried rice. But you see some gourmet suggestions beginning to appear. This is from the 1960s. And you get things that maybe look a little bit uh, Trader Vic, South Pacific, uh, Asian, uh, I'm not sure what. <clears throat> Another 82nd Avenue, 1960, uh, Chinese restaurant in Portland. And uh, in old in New Portland, Portland's New Chinatown, this was uh, Rickshaw Charlie's, it's still there. Um, Chinese American food. Across the street to the left was Fong Chong's, which was a Chinese market, both owned by the same family. Fong Chong was one of the first places to introduce uh, what we now call dim sum, where carts of freshly made uh, dumplings and noodle dishes and so on were paraded around and you picked and said, I'll have two of these and one of those and so on. So it's, this is not the same thing as the chop suey joints. Um, Rickenshaw Charlie's office, op obviously is playing off a lot of Chinese stereotypes there. Notice also the Chinese uh, phone booth, the corner there. And in the background is an ad for Forbidden City, Chinese and American food, way out at 94th and Sandy Boulevard, um, suburban, cocktails and banquets, probably dancing. That ad is on this building, notice the balconies. That's the 1911 building built for the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, which was a uh, educational and service group uh, which still exists and still is in that building. The lifting of the remnants of the Chinese exclusion law, the American military actions in Korea and Vietnam, and the opening of China during the Nixon administration all contributed to um, a new wave of Asian uh, immigrants to the U.S., especially to the West Coast. Among the uh, repercussions was exposure to Chinese foods that reflected other parts of China beyond Canton, Guangzhou, um, even though those restaurants may carry on. The fabulous Hung Far Low sign. Um, as I earlier mentioned, the restaurant itself, another one of these second story establishments who climbed the stairs to Hung Far Low's. Uh, Hung Far Low's was also noted for its very dark cocktail lounge where you could trip and fall before you got to the bar, and um, for its, uh, um, its sign which was this incredible bit of neon work. And when Hung Far Lo deserted uh, downtown old Chinatown for the 82nd Avenue, the sign went into decline, but it was saved and recently was rehabilitated and put back right where it was, although Hung Far Lo's is not there anymore. Uh, the sign is, it's now become its own icon of new, 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 Old Chinatown, I guess. Newer places had more adventurous menus and even names like uh, Bill's Gold Coin. Who's Bill? 
I don't know. <laughs> um, Bill has also stirred up its menu with riffs uh, from Trader Vic's and other South Sea tiki bar things that were popular. Uh, but its roots are still Cantonese. And it tells you here about ordering Chinese. You should, you know, order that kind of family style, you know, order uh, things and share them. And their Chinese dishes, however, go a little bit beyond chop suey and chow mein. The first signs of a, a major change uh, occurred in San Francisco, um, where a small restaurant called Hunan opened in 1974. Uh, the photo shows uh, uh, Henry, Chan, uh, Henry Chung, and he's holding a picture of his wife, Diana Chung. Uh, she was uh, perhaps the prime instigator of the Hunan restaurant. Um, and Hunan takes its name, of course, from another Chinese province. And uh, another one, Sichuan, starts showing up in restaurant names. And what also shows up are different styles of cooking. Um, one major uh, feature being peppers, hot. Um, when Hunan first opened, there was a, uh, an article about it in the New Yorker magazine that became something of a sensation. And newspapers picked it up as well. And uh, I had to go eat some. Uh, just before I moved to Jacksonville. <laughs> and it was so hot I nearly fell off my stool. <laughs> it was blisteringly hot. But it was also wonderful. And it was certainly different. It was m far more exotic than the exotic stuff from Cannes Hangkow in and Seaside. Well, like so many uh, such things, um, Henry Chung and, his, uh, Chung and the Chung family uh, still operate Hunan and a couple of spin-offs from it. Uh, and more than 40 members of his family are involved in that operation in San Francisco. The first Hunan and Sichuan influenced restaurants opened in Portland about the same time in the 70s. And chop suey uh, and noodles and Cantonese cuisine uh, began to be joined by other restaurants serving dishes from Sichuan, Hunan, other Chinese regions, and things heated up and the heat spread. But still, there's this continuity of many Chinese restaurants being tied to family-run operations. Here is uh, Gold Wall was a place I remember eating in, at in, when I lived in Portland area. And the, actually, this is when I lived in Jacksonville. And we'd go to Portland and visit the Gold Wall in Beaverton. Um, and at first, you look on the left there, and it's egg roll, fried rice, deep fried shrimp, sweet and sour. That's Cantonese from, from the Wayback Machine. But then you have to open the page inside, and there are these starred items. And all of these are hot dishes. And you see more familiar today terms like Kung Pao chicken, eggplant Sichuan sauce, um, hot braised chili pork. Uh, this is different. This is not chop suey chow mein although you can still get that. And from 2016, Sichuan Restaurant Bend, another family-owned, uh, family-style Chinese restaurant that serves something a little different from Cantonese. <clears throat> Jenny Lee wrote a book called The Fortune Cookie Chronicles, Adventures in the World of Chinese Food. See a copy of it there. Uh, it was uh, an account of her journey in, across 42 states and 23 countries, exploring uh, the secrets of Chinese food. A reviewer uh, wrote about her book um, and said, the main point of the book is that the foods we think of as Chinese, chop suey, general tso's chicken, it's a new one, fortune cookies aren't. <clears throat> Like the author herself, those foods look Chinese, but they're actually American. Chop suey was invented here. General Tso's was invented here. The white takeout boxes were invented here. <laughs> we have one here. <laughs> Even fortune cookies, the most iconic of all Chinese foods, originally came from Japan before being popularized here in the US. And uh, as Jenny Lee reports, most of them are made in New Jersey. <laughs> the ones on the table there are made in New York State. 
And I picked him up in Klamath Falls. <laughs> As Jenny put it, our benchmark for Americanness is apple pie. But ask yourself, how often do you eat apple pie? How often do you eat Chinese food? There are several elements to the legacy of Chinese cooks in Oregon. One is that there are still Cantonese Chinese restaurants run by families with a long history. Um, that uh, Club Cafe in Burns, Oregon is now known, uh, still run by descendants of the Yi family. Um, it's now known as the Highlander. <laughs> still Chinese and American though. Those pictures on the wall are still on the wall. Uh, the decor has not changed. The sweet and sour soup was, and I had some just last year, uh, was just like always. Burns, you may remember, is named for that Scott Bard, um, Bobby Burns. And so that's why you have a Scotsman on the cover of the menu for, <laughs> for the Chinese restaurant in, in Burns, Oregon. Even vanished restaurants like Kim's in Medford and Hung Far Low in Portland um, remind us of the long run of those institutions and the place that they held in their communities. Many of the newer Chinese restaurants with hotted up menus from the north and the west have been established through pooling family monies and labor, much the same way that, ones, that that was done in the late 19th and early 20th century. The influx of many other Asian immigrants in Oregon in the past four decades Vietnamese, Hmong, Lao, Thai, Malaysian, Nepalese, Indian. It's really incredible to see a Bhutanese restaurant in Portland has made Chinese food, Cantonese, to seem less exotic to the larger Caucasian public, but has not erased it. Now, Cantonese chop suey is just one of many ex exotic Asian influence dishes we can all eat. <coughs> The pagoda is gone. Uh, the Republic is still around and still serves a menu that looks almost the same as it did in 1930. Chinese sojourners and immigrants were a notable component of Oregon's population from the 1850s into the 1920s. They were visible and they dis faced discrimination in working and living here. Initially, there were very few Chinese women, and thus very few Chinese families. Many of the families remained in China while men came to make a living in, in Oregon. Cooking became one avenue to acceptance. First for single Chinese men who worked as cooks in hotels and cafes and homes, and then as proprietors or workers in restaurants that catered to both American tastes and Chinese tastes. In time, the Chinese American Cafe Often a family-run institution, as families became more possible in Oregon, became an institution not only in Portland, but also in many small towns throughout the state. In my Oregon Coast childhood, I thought just as every town had a post office and a supermarket and a sawmill and a Chinese restaurant, even today with more than half a century behind us, nearly every Oregon town can still point to a Chinese restaurant. I mean, coming down here, I, it's like, there's another one, there's another one. Oh, Elmira, Oregon has a Chinese restaurant selling chop suey. Nearly every Oregon town can point to a restaurant run by an Asian family. A family that's not shunned or feared or bullied or marginalized, but rather is very much part of the town's civic fabric. The Yees and Burns, the Cans and Seaside, the families of <coughs> of Kim's and Medford are part of a complex society in which there has been room for change and adaptation. So I want you all to please go and go and eat your sashimi and your Peruvian quinoa and your Indian naan and your Syrian falafel and uh, your sashimi because it's all good. And you can have some Cantonese chop suey too. It's still, and once again, tasty and exotic. And it's still, and once again, at least as American as apple pie. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>